Um, okay, so once again, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Annie McCann. I'm one of the co-founders of the Right Pen Collective, which is a newly created network. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, that we had created to support, connect, and empower Muslim writers here in Australia. Because one of the questions that we asked was where are all the Muslim writers here in Australia? We've got so many fantastic Muslim writers around the world, but we haven't connected with any here in Australia. So that was pretty much why we connected this network. And as a launch uh, to our you know, program group, whatever you like to call it, we've actually come to you live with a virtual festival, which is Australia's first ever virtual festival for Australian Muslim writers and creators, which is very exciting. Um, so before I continue, though, I would just like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land in which I'm standing on today. Specifically, I'm coming to you live from the land of the Daruk people of the Eora Nation. I would also like to extend my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledging that the land that we are on is stolen land and sovereignty was not conceded. So welcome to day two of our program. Uh, yesterday went very well. We had first two pro um, panels with an opening and a poetry program. Uh, today we actually come to you live with two international best-selling authors coming to you live from the US and Canada. So first I'd like to introduce you to, in alphabetical order, Asma Zanahat Khan. She's the author of the Khorasan Archives and a mystery book called The Unde... Unde Voices, oh, quiet voices. Sorry, you're going to have to correct me on that. The, the have... Unquiet Dead. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. You're but, welcome. Uh, but this is the book I read. This is my gateway. So The Blueprint, <laughs> which is the Coruscant Archives, is basically my favorite. And of course, uh, Usma Jalaluddin, the best-selling author of Aisha at last, and her new book, Hannah Khan Carries On. To both of you, welcome and good evening. Thank you for taking your time to tune in from all the way in the US and Canada. How are you both? Doing well. Hello. Doing well. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, it's so good to see you. We've we've spoken before through my other network uh, readers review. Uh, we've done a few chats together, but it is an absolute honour to have both of you here as part of a Muslim network that we're part of here in Australia. So thank you so much for giving up your time for us today. Um, so just before I uh, get into the nitty gritty of the event, just wanted to let everybody know that if you do have questions for our guests, please feel free to send them through to me directly. My name on the chat is The Right Pen Collective. Send them directly to me. Um, please also remind, uh, remember that this is a safe place. So please ensure that all comments and questions are respectful. Any form of abuse or disrespect will not be tolerated and we are not above removing you from the panel. So thank you for that. Um, also just a reminder that if you would like to get any of the books that are written by our amazing guests, there is a link in the chat. Um, uh, that links us to our festival partners, which is Better Read Than Dead Bookstore, which is in Sydney, Newtown. They are an amazing, diverse bookstore that stock these books. Um, and oh, by the way, it's free shipping. So get on there, get some books and get some free shipping. We found out last night. So thank you for that, Better Read Than Dead, amazing partners. And we also have some um, Instagram and Twitter handles going through the chat. If you'd like to connect with any of the founders or myself after the event, that'd be great. So ladies, once again, welcome. Thank you again for being here. Um, Asma, if I could just start with you, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and the books that you have written so far. That's me, right? Yeah, that's you, Asma. Did I say that right? Asma. No, you, just, you did, absolutely. But sometimes, <laughs> I know Asma is fine. <laughs> So first of all, assalamu alaikum and good evening or good morning as the case may be to all the attendees. Thank you so much to Annie and to everyone organizing the festival for inviting us. It's a pleasure and an honor for us to be here. Um, I just came back to the U.S. For after three lovely months in Canada, so I'm still adjusting. And even though my time zone difference was only two hours, it feels like 24. So I'm just getting settled back into normal life. But uh, I write both crime fiction and fantasy fiction. And I have a five book crime series called the Issa Khatak and Rachel Getty series, which features a Canadian Muslim detective of the same South Asian background as myself, who solves crimes with his junior partner, Rachel, uh, related to global human rights issues. So that's where I first came in in publishing. I started with crime fiction. And then I think after my first two crime novels were published, uh, my first fantasy novel, which is part of a quartet of four books, uh, was published with Harper Voyager, um, and that book is called The Blood Print, and it's part of a series called The Khorasan Archives, which was my way of reaching into Islamic history, some of the touchstones of Islamic history, and using them to animate a question which I'm really interested in, which is who has power over our interpretation of faith, 
and um, how ideology can be wielded both as a sword for good or a club for evil. And in the story of the blood print, it's a band of female warriors who hold that power in their hand and they're trying to take down um, a patriarchy called the talisman, which is a thin, thinly veiled analog to the Taliban. Um, I'm, I myself am a Pakistani Patan or Pashtun woman. So I was very interested in writing about the human rights abuses of the Taliban. Of course, I was thinking back to the period in the late 1990s, early 2000s, not realizing that we were going to be seeing the same things again very soon in our, in our present moment. So I don't think the series could be more relevant or timely because I'm in that series, I'm writing about specifically what's been happening in Afghanistan, but then moving it outward to the broader Muslim world. Uh, and I've also written a middle grade nonfiction novel called Ramadan as part of the Orca origin series, which is for classrooms and kids to teach them about what Ramadan means to Muslims and how they practice it around the world. So that's kind of a, a brief synopsis. And I come to my writing from a background in human rights law. That's so exciting. And as you can see, you can tell which I'm the most biggest fan of, which is the fantasy <laughs> series, because I couldn't even remember your other one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite yeah. all right and I have to say like as a, as a Muslim reader in Australia I still remember the first time I saw the blood print on uh, the book at uh, the bookshelf and I looked at it and I'm like yes I see what she's done there like the thin <laughs> veil Taliban I see what she's done there this is exciting this is mine and I've been reading the series so yes thank you so much for writing that for us thank Uzma, you for reading. Uh, oh thank you Uzma, over to you <laughs> Uh, yeah, so assalamu alaikum and also good morning and good evening to everyone. I'm so happy to be here uh, talking with you all today and thank you Annie and the rest of the uh, Write Pen Collective organizers for inviting us. Um, so I write, I, I've written two novels. I should have gone first, Asma, you totally upstaged me. <laughs> <laughs> you're both amazing. It's not a competition. You are both amazing. No, no, no. <laughs> you always, always both have film deals, don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say, you know, I always tell Asma, Asma and I are good friends. So I always tell her that she's writer goals and that she's my inspiration because, you know, mashallah, she's written, what is it, 50, 25 books? I'm just kidding. No, 10 books, 10. right? 10. Yeah, <laughs> only 10. Only 10. Uh, mashallah, she's, uh, she's so hardworking and talented. It's it's actually, uh, I'm, you know, always inspired by you. Uh, so I've written two novels. Um, the first one, uh, Annie, I think you have it behind you, Aisha at Last. Uh, and this yeah. is the, the UK version. Uh, sorry, where is it? Oh, it's, it's over there. Uh, that's the yeah. UK version. And then my second novel is Hannah Khan Carries On, which is right behind me. That's the uh, the cover that's in Australia, I believe, uh, in, yes, in the UK. Yes. I, I write, which is the one uh, I have. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the cover that's out there. And the one behind me, that's the, uh, the US cover. Um, yeah. And I write funny uh, romantic comedies starring Muslim characters. Uh, both of my books are set in Toronto. My first one is basically a retelling of Pride and Prejudice, except it's set in a, a close-knit South Asian Toronto Muslim community. And then my second novel, I set it in the same neighborhood uh, of Toronto, which is a very diverse, very rich uh, neighborhood, uh, except uh, my, I took for my inspiration one of my favorite rom-com movies, You've Got Mail. Uh, so it's You've Got Mail, but it's set in rival halal restaurants in Toronto. Uh, and in addition to that, and both of them are just, they're fun, they're they're light, uh, but they do delve into a lot of uh, issues of community identity, um, some of the issues in uh, of being the daughter or the son or the child of immigrants. Um, and in my second novel in particular, there is a, a, a hate-motivated a hate attack against a Muslim neighborhood that's sort of delved into as well. Um, in addition to that, I'm a high school teacher. I teach English, uh, and I also write a column for Canada's largest newspaper. Uh, I've been writing it for about six years. Uh, for the Toronto Star. I've written for The Atlantic and uh, I recently wrote a play, uh, a romantic comedy play that I hope once, you know, COVID sort of settles down or whatever our new world looks like, uh, we'll be, we'll be uh, into production hopefully early uh, 2022. Well, that's exciting. Well, I hope that you can record that play so I can watch it here in Australia. That would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Things I can't cross the border over there. I'm just seeing the chats are up. Thank you so much for all the comments so, so far. Someone had already said, Darcy, who? Give us Khalid. Like, forget Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> the Pride you. of Prejudice. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I, I should have, sorry, I should have added, uh, both of my books mm. have been optioned for film. Yes. <laughs> I'm very excited. I'm very excited. As you can see, 
big fan. Um, yes, just the chats have erupted. Thank you so much for all of that. And as you can see, everybody, um, there, you know, the, the writing spectrum here is like completely opposite ends of the scale here. We've got like, you know, funny comedy, and we've got mystery and fantasy. But that's that's the one lovable thing I love about writing is that whilst we might be all Muslim, we're all diverse in terms of what we love and what we're writing, which is what I'm, I'm amazed about, which is great. There's this common misconception we heard yesterday from uh, Randa Abdel Fattah that if you're a hijabi woman or a Muslim woman, writing um everything you write is an autobiography and it's going to be an <laughs> it's going to be a book about you know the struggle and you know your struggle for identity and it's, no that's not what we're all about we're more than this which is incredible can you walk us through um this is an open question for both of you that very first time you picked up a pen and you decided to write what was the inspiration either of you can take this one let's not you go first oh <laughs> thanks <laughs> <laughs> Um, the first time, I, I mean, I would have to go back to my childhood. I, I think I've always been, I've always been a reader and I've always been a writer. So my very early attempts at writing were probably uh, children's stories. Um, I kept a diary for decades um, throughout my entire teens and most of my 20s. Mm -hmm. I, I kept a diary. Yeah, I, I was reading it the other day. It's very boring. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> I had like zero life and the things that I thought were like super dramatic at the time I was like oh um but <laughs> what I didn't what I did develop was the practice of writing um I got used to putting down my thoughts and uh developing my voice so that was really important and um actually the I I, I did start writing my first novel my first sort of novel it was uh it was uh Esma, I don't think I ever told you this it was it was a science fiction novel I started writing it in high school and I was very much inspired by I don't know if you guys are science fiction fans I, I'm a I've always been a comedy writer I love Douglas Adams so he is a he was a writer from the 70s wow. and 80s yes. who writes yeah. uh who wrote uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy still yeah. one of my all-time favorite books love it and I wrote a book that was basically Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy but like my 17 year old interpretation I think I got a page about 100 and then I gave up on it and it was it was it was bad it was really really bad um but you know everyone's first draft is always a work in progress and I was just playing around with form with genre with voice uh but that uh it wasn't until I, I many years later when I was uh, home on maternity leave with my second son and I thought okay it's now or never you know I I just know that if I don't start the book that I I hope to one day get published now um I don't know when it'll happen so I was in my late 20s at the time uh, and uh, the book was, and I, I started that in probably 2007, and that book didn't get anywhere either. It wasn't until my, I guess, technically my my third attempt at writing a book that I wrote Aisha at last, and I started that around 2010, and uh, it took seven years for me to to finish it and to find an agent and to get published. Yeah, as an emerging writer myself, I can attest that writing is a marathon, not a sprint. I'm still working on my work in progress, and I started that two, three years ago. So I'm yep. still going. And whether that's going to get published or not, is there's no guarantee either. You know, like you're guaranteed a fellowship, but you're not guaranteed a publication. So inshallah, you know. Um, there's been a few qu uh, requests already. You know, can you please write a Muslim sci-fi? Can we can we see one? I mean, I know <laughs> there is one. I should there dust it off. And <laughs> <laughs> please dust it off, revisit that. I know there is one. Um, some Maya Dawood wrote Mirage, which is like Mirage. A, I was just about yeah. to say that. Yeah, what about yeah. Mirage? Check it That's out. That's a good, book. yeah, good Muslim sci-fi. Loved and adored that duology. It's amazing. Yeah. But yeah, definitely dust that off and don't, don't say never so. <laughs> no, very bad. I'd have to start from scratch, but you know, who oh, knows sure. what's in my future. Who who knows? Asma, over to you. First time you picked up a pen and started writing. Like Asma, from the time I was a child, I've been writing, though I mainly started with nonfiction, doing a lot of journalism. And then as I was growing up, I uh, wrote a column for our local paper. I was the editor of my high school paper. I actually founded a, I went to a girl's school and I founded a literary journal there called Castle Ch Signatures, which was named after our school, which was called Trafalgar Castle. Um, and then all through law school, I was writing on the side, a lot of uh, legal pieces. Then of course came the monster of my dissertation. Uh, but I, like Usma, was also writing a lot of fiction. And I started with things like short stories, plays, um, songs. I'm still trying to convince Usma to write a musical with me, even though, <laughs> even though neither one of us can Can you play. please do that? We're so enthralled <laughs> by the forum. We want to be like the Lin-Manuel Miranda of our community and write one of those. Um, and, I, and I wrote a lot of fan fiction for things like the Labyrinth movie and Star Trek. And I tried a fantasy, a really terrible fantasy novel, I think, when I was... 
14 years old that I, I didn't abandon. I finished mine. It was 300 pages, but it was excruciatingly oh. bad. <laughs> and, uh, and I started some version of the blood print back then to the romance elements of the story. And then um, I was really preoccupied with my career in law for a long time, but I still tried to write nonfiction pieces related to human rights because I had always wanted to be a journalist um, and then ended up in the law instead. And then finally, I had a little bit of time off in between careers and I sat down and wrote my first crime novel, which I pitched everywhere and also did not get published. So it's a trunked novel, but it's the prequel to The Unquiet Dead. So it's the crime novel where my two detectives meet Rachel and Issa. And that didn't go anywhere. So I just moved on and wrote the second one, which is actually based, based on my dissertation research into the Bosnian genocide. And so that one I was able to, in a kind of fairy tale way, entered it into a contest, didn't win the contest, but nonetheless, the story came to the eye of an editor there. And um, she, she sent me a list of, I think it was 20 pages of suggested edits and revisions and said, are you willing to put this kind of work into the unquiet dead? And I said, oh, absolutely. And she goes, but we're not guaranteeing you anything. And I said, that's fine. I will do this work. And it was, you know, really, really great editorial notes. The first time I'd ever had them. And it did take me six months to turn the book around. And then when I resubmitted it, it was published. And then I thought, oh, why don't I be cheeky? And I tried to get them to buy the second book at the same time. And it worked. So then I had a two book contract and I moved on for there, from there. But meanwhile, mm -hmm. the blood print had been written and finished and lying in the background. And at that time, I was unagented. So when I was looking for an agent, I said that one of the things I want is someone who not only represents my crime fiction, but who can sell this fantasy novel that's been sitting around for a while. So that's my path. Wow. And you doing, doing two things at once, multitasking. I don't, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> well done. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Osma can attest to the fact that those were five very brutal years in which I was constantly crying on her shoulder and begging oh. for mercy. <laughs> This you is need to write a friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need a writer friend and you also need the sisterhood um, 100%. Um, one of the things that I've learned um, over, the, over the time that I've been writing is before you even get to an agent or a publisher, you know, go to trusted friends and share pieces of your manuscript, get feedback because, you know, and, but don't share it with family, share it with somebody who actually understands writing. They will give you that constructive feedback too. Um, would you say that would be the same same sort of thing you would do as well? Oh yeah, yeah definitely. Asma definitely. reads all of my first drafts. In fact, I gave her uh, whatever I've written so far of my third book because sometimes mm -hmm. I just need someone to read it halfway through before I halfway through my first draft just to make sure that I'm on the right track. And, and I always yeah. tell her, just lie to me, tell me it's good. Uh, so I'll actually <laughs> it, finish. It's always good, so I don't have to lie. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you when you say that. <laughs> I do believe you. Um, no, yeah, I, 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 I didn't oh, have, please. sorry, I was just going to say, I didn't Go have ahead. a critique partner for my works. I was like one of those self-conscious writers hiding in my basement, refusing to show anyone anything. But when I met Usma and got to know her and she'd sent me her first book, I was like, oh, this seems like an opportunity for me. And then I started sending her my things as well. And she's like, helped me so much editorially, especially with the Horizon archives, because I've made her read those drafts again and again. I and wanted again. to. I wanted to. They were so <laughs> and, good. And help her and help me iron out those characters. And the really strange thing is we're both from Toronto, but I've been living in the States for the last 15 years. And then it turned out that Usma lives seven minutes away from my parents' house, which is I where I always stay when I go to Toronto. So wild. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. Small world. <laughs> <laughs> Meant to be, definitely, definitely. One thing that I learned um, in Australia is that when it comes to writing and submitting, you don't necessarily need an agent, but that's not the case where you are. Is that correct? You actually need an agent before you get to a publisher. Is that is that true? Where you it's are? Certainly, it certainly yeah. improves your chances, for sure. Yes. Like okay. I didn't need it when I submitted my first two books, but if I had, there's a lot of places that won't look at an agent, a lot of publishers won't accept unagented submissions. And mm -hmm. if you're doing, and if in that rare case where I entered the contest and then directly connected with an editor, I didn't sign the best contract I could have had I been represented by an agent. I signed away a lot of rights, not knowing that those rights could have been retained by me. So I would right. always recommend if you're, if you're submitting in the North American market and you want to get picked up, you should have an agent first and you should query extensively to find that agent. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Oh, that's really good to know. Mm. It, do, it does depend. Sometimes if, if you're going for a, a smaller or more boutique uh, publisher, then you might not need an agent, but then um, the scope of that, the print run, et cetera, might be, you know, uh, affected by that as well. So it, it, it just sure. sort of depends. But there are, there's yeah. lots of asset publication, self-publishing. That's also very popular. Yeah. Lately. 
Yes, it is. We've been learning as well that um, that's, you know, not the pathway you go on just because you can't get published traditionally. There are people who are making conscious decisions, yeah, to do that because you retain the rights of everything 100% as an indie author or self-published author. Um, but as Muslim women, you know, writing books that represent the Muslim community um, or it's not set in America, so to speak, in some cases, um, or it represents a non-white market. How did you go um, in terms of, you know, pitching that to, you know, a, a Western market, did you struggle based on that or was it welcomed in America or in Canada? You go with uh, Yeah, sure. Um, I, I know for me, I wrote, I, I very consciously wrote a novel that that centered the brown, the brown uh, experience, the brown Muslim experience. Yeah. And um, in during the drafting of it, because it took me so long, I felt like I myself as a writer changed and evolved in that process. So when I was, uh, when I was first writing it, I, I know that I, was still very self-conscious of my story and the types of assumptions that I was worried that people would make. Um, and I and I was doing a lot of like uh, educating my reader. So like at the end of my book, I had a glossary, uh, you know, defining all of the words that I thought would be sort of exotic for, you know, and I was picturing in my mind the, the white mainstream reader. Um, but over the, the years that it took me to draft the book, I took out the glossary. I removed a lot of sort of those explanatory commas, um, just thinking that, you know, I, I want to keep in mind and be very mindful of the fact that um, hopefully a lot of Muslim, a lot of brown South Asians will be reading my book and they don't need these things to be explained to them and everyone else can Google it because these these ideas are very easily Googleable. Um, that being said, when I went to try to find an agent, when I went to try to find a, a publisher, I did, as usual, face a lot of rejection. And I think that's kind of par for the course for all writers. It's, you know, if you're not good at dealing with rejection, this is probably not the, <laughs> not a very good industry for you. Um, and I, I did have a little bit of that reaction where, a lot of American publishers, in fact, were very wary. This was around 2016, as the We Need Diverse Books and Own Voices movement was just gaining steam and uh, becoming more popular. Uh, I had a lot of American uh, editors say, we don't know what the market would be. We don't know who would, we would sell this uh, to. And in fact, my book was first sold in the Canadian market um, and then subsequently sold, uh, sold elsewhere. Uh, but I was basically rejected by everyone in the United States that my editor queried uh, and then picked up by HarperCollins Canada. And they've been fantastic. My, my editor is white, uh, but she's been very supportive, uh, especially about the cultural elements of my book uh, and religious elements of my book. Th that was my experience. Oh, wow. Okay. Asma, same, same with you? Uh, no, my, my books are quite different. different. My crime series, um, so the main character of color, the Muslim character, is the lead detective. And over the course of the five books in the series, he opens up more and becomes more explicit about who he is, his roots, his traditions, his attachment to his faith, and how his faith is the lens through which he views not only his world, but actually his work as, a, as an investigator. So in the first book, he's a much more detached character, and maybe that was a little bit easier for uh, a white audience to relate to. Um, the crime reading audience in the United States is 90% uh, women, usually over 55. And so that would be a hard char harder character for them to relate to. But most of the people who work in publishing, um, agents, editors, associate editors, they're usually quite young. So they're, um, they're raised in a multicultural world. They're very open to that. They're looking for that. And I think there was a moment three or four years ago where Muslim writers were a hot commodity and very much in demand. So when I was working with my young editor, um, who's a couple of decades younger than me, but incredibly sharp and smart, uh, she wanted me to position the character in such a way that the broader mystery reading public could relate to him. And then he would be more than a character or a series of books being sold to a niche audience because that niche audience in the Muslim community really wasn't there for crime fiction, adult crime fiction. Um, and so there was also something in the marketing where they wanted to call the mysteries the Rachel, Getty, and Issa Hatek mystery series. And I wanted it the other way around because he really was my lead character. So I think it took me until book two or three to attain that reversal. And to be quite honest with you, after five books, one novella, and one short story, um, the series was discontinued because it didn't reach that mass audience. And I don't know if it's because the things that I were, were writing about were so... I don't know the right word for it, so heavy, because I wrote about the Syrian refugee crisis, the Bosnian genocide, I wrote about the plight of political prisoners in Iran, or if it was because they were being interpreted through this lens of this very devout Muslim man who lived his life entirely according to his faith. Um, so that's a question I haven't uh, solved for myself yet. 
But with my mm. fantasy series, the, the fantasy publishers and editors are obviously looking for things that are as different or as niche or as unseen as possible. And in the first book, I'm not even sure that they could tell that I was writing about the Muslim world uh, because I use a whole different set of um, place names and identifiers that are very much analogous to the actual places. But if you didn't already know that part of the world or the history, you wouldn't necessarily pick it up. And I found that with my fantasy series, I have readers who read it purely on the surface, not even knowing that I'm writing about Islamic history or the Middle East. And then I have Muslim readers who know exactly what I'm talking about and are, are finding all the little Easter eggs buried in the story as well. So, um, so I think there was a big difference between how those series, were, those two series were marketed and received by the audience. And one, the crime series was very much pitched to a, uh, a Western audience and for the white gays. Um, but the, mis the fantasy series was very much, as me as a writer, I was writing for us, for our communities, about us and for us. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, when you're trying to find that balance between, you know, writing for yourself and writing for your community, but also accessing a community that doesn't quite understand or speak your language. It's trying to find that right balance and then, you know, moving from there. Because, you know, there, there are a lot of, you know, non-Muslim people who read the, the books uh, purely because they're written by a Muslim author or that it has a Muslim representation and they find it interesting. So it's not that there's no readers out there. It's not that they don't want to do it. I think from what I'm hearing is that there is this hesitancy in the publishing industry because of the predominant, you know, non-Muslim or non-diversity of that publishing industry. I think that's probably where there is that bit of he hesitancy from what I'm hearing as well. Um, but in terms of, yeah, like what Asma was saying too, like when I picked up the blood print, there was like two things that came out of me straight away. I'm like, ah, yeah, I know what she did there. That's fantastic. And that's why as a Muslim reader, that, that's very exciting. And it's also interesting what you mentioned earlier. I think it was Uzma who mentioned it, that it was only uh, five years ago that this diversity movement in books had started. That, that's not that long ago. So clearly that's not something we grew up, we didn't grow up with this. Like I grew up in Australia, Western suburbs of Sydney. And um you know, when I went to school, multiculturalism was, you know, heavily embraced and, you know, we were all respected being Muslim or, you know, non-Christian, that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, in terms of the library, it wasn't very diverse and it wasn't only until the last five years that it's happened. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there's been a movement, particularly where you are in the last five years for diverse books? I don't know. That's actually a really good question. I, I'm not sure if it was just um, capitalism is now like looking for new markets. Maybe uh, that has, I'm sure that has something to do with it. So I also cynical. think there's... <laughs> It's true. <laughs> <That accurate laughs> we can devour more worlds. Um, but also, I, I think it, it, it was a lot of advocacy from within uh, publishing, mm -hmm. right? I, th I think a lot of like the chorus of voices that have always been there just somehow got louder. I think they all found each other on so social media and, and like the We Need Diverse Books movement really started on Twitter, right? It, it, correct me if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, but I, I think it was a hashtag, I think. Twitter, yeah. And it was like, it's almost like you find people who are living in other parts of the country or other parts of the world that are like, you had that experience, I had that experience. And then it just kind of amplified from there. Um, and I don't know if it was like, if it was, if there was a separate experience that was happening in the world of entertainment, like in, in terms of like the diversity that you now see on the screen that simply was not there 10 years ago. Um, mm. And, and I, I don't know if that was different from the, the publishing thing, but it almost seemed like we were, we're having a little bit of a, uh, a revolution in, in the way mm -hmm. that we are uh, the things that we're accepting and the things that we're kind of like no you need to do better now not not in five years don't have a committee about it we need to do better now and publishers I think are um trying I think they're trying I do think I think there's a long way to go but I, I do think that they are they are trying and I can mm. see the change that has happened even in the past five years um but it's it's uh very recent like like it's it's, mm. it's like we're, uh, we're, we, we've been starting to take this movement seriously so recently um it's shocking actually that's not what do you yeah. think I think it also helps that the people moving up into publishing now all the junior ranks are people who've come of age during the country's biggest protest movement social justice movements they're very well educated they're very compassionate they're very informed um, and they, they've been raised in a different milieu than the senior white establishment in publishing. So you have a, a lot of allies that you're not expecting to find mm. who are advocating for your books behind the scenes, but they haven't yet reached those senior ranks of power in the industry. My agent, for example, was actively looking for books like mine and still does and signed a lot of writers like me after she 
picked me up as one of her clients. And I know for a fact that my books would never have been picked up by Minotaur was it not for that young editor, whose name is Elizabeth Lacks, who since left publishing, but who so strongly advocated for me for a marketing budget for me. So it helps to have those people on the inside who see the value of your storytelling voice and the stories that you want to tell and um, help you tell them in the most effective way possible. That's part of it. Another big trend, of course, is the ubiquity of the internet. So we're all connected to each other now around the globe. We're able to get our message out. I mean, you could just see that in the recent, the fourth Gaza war, where nobody ever talked about Palestinians uh, as people entitled to human rights and human dignity, but the power of the internet of Palestinians showing the reality of that war from the inside really, really changed the conversation. And I think we're seeing that in, in publishing as well, that when you print a book that is hostile to minority communities, you're gonna hear back about it. It's not just gonna yep. pass silently through the waters. Yep. There's very so engaged, engaged readership. And it's not just those minority communities who are engaged. They have a whole host of allies who speak up on those questions too. And that puts pressure on publishing, which like any industry changes incrementally, really slowly, but does, does look at those things. And it certainly helps when there's breakout books like The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, um, any of those books that does really, really well, like in crime fiction, uh, Sean Cosby's book, Black Top Wasteland, and his second book, they've both been picked up for movie deals immediately. And he's a black writer from the South. And that's, you don't see a lot of black writers getting that kind of marketing budget in publishing. So when you see it, it means it's opening the door for all the writers coming after. And I'm in a crime writing group called Crime Writers of Color with Sean Cosby. And so you see all in that group, we have people who haven't been published yet, who are getting mentoring advice from people who've already broken through. So I think all of those little things are making change. Yeah, that's really good. Like there is movement, it is happening. It's just, it might be slow, but it is happening, which is very good news. It's very welcome news to me, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, we have a question come through from one of our co-founders, Axen. I'm just gonna unmute Axen um, so she can ask the question. So excuse me while I just find her for a sec. Um, hang on, there we go, should be right. Okay, um, well, I think, no, I think, she, can she hear me? I'm not sure if she can hear me, but- She's still muted. Is she still muted? Hang on. I don't know. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Aksan's here. Yes, Aksan. Uh, Please ask your question. Uh, Osma uh, and um, Uzma, you, you ladies are just great. It's listening to you. The first yes. thing that comes to my mind is I have to say this. You know, we <laughs> always, we notoriously, we know that Americans are notoriously risk takers, right? Uh, and us down under, we're conservative Australians. So this also reflects the, the market. And having a market determines um, the demand. So do you think these two factors had an effect uh, in, in your success in publishing? I mean, for me as a Canadian, I, I feel like Canadians and Australians are probably very similar. Like we are uh, probably a little bit more conservative if you want to put it that way but I I was my book was rejected like the idea of having a romantic comedy where the both the main leads are South Asian and not just that but Muslim and devout Muslims like I wrote a rom-com where nobody touches uh it seemed it's 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 kind yeah. of like yeah. and the first book they don't even you know there's just like uh the barest caress uh that that happens in both of my books they're very like halal um yeah was rejected by everybody like uh we we went on we went on submission to about two dozen editors in the U.S. and everyone was like I like it but no I like it but no and I just don't see they, they didn't see how it, it could be uh marketed but my con in Canada uh Harper Collins Canada took a chance on me I was a complete unknown I mean I, I was I did have a column in the newspaper but you know aside from that I was basically an unknown writer um so I'm I'm always very I, I'm I always feel very happy that uh my own country is the one who kind of pushed me forward and then through their through their the fact that they kind of put their uh their hand up and 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 published Aisha at last that's how I found an American audience and an American publisher which ended up being Penguin Random House so you know that worked out and in the and, and in other countries in the world too uh what about you Asma? Um, I can't remember the question. I'm sorry. Can you just repeat the question? I was so caught up in your answer. Oxen? Basically, it was like, are yeah. the American, uh, sorry, you, you can probably oh, explain it. I, yeah. Yeah. I'll get Oxen to re repeat it. Uh, you know, uh, Americans are great risk takers. So do you think this factor 
uh, affected your success in publishing? That's because Australians are so we're we're reserved, we're conservative, we're not we're not as great risk takers as Americans. I mean, we can't deny this. We have to be open about it. So, do you think that factor really did determine your success in publishing? I think so, but I think it was just one of many factors on the creative side. Americans absolutely are risk takers, but. Publishing is first and foremost a business. So that risk-taking mentality on the creative side where editors want your book, they want to pay you a lot, they want to devote more marketing resources, they're always being called to account by accountants and people who are looking to make sure that books earn out and publish the publishing house doesn't founder. So there's that side of it. I think um, another big factor was it was the moment. People were looking for new, very different properties in the American market. And so our books hit just at the right time. I don't know yes. if five years earlier, five years later, there would have been that big splash, but I was, you know, I was being marketed as the first um, practicing Muslim author writing a Muslim detective. And I got so much publicity just for that point of distinction. Um, so yeah, I do think that was a factor, but it, it certainly wasn't the only one. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks, Aksan. We had a couple of questions come through um, from our audience. Uzka, one of our co-founders, also would like to ask, uh, this one's for Uzma. Um, Uzma, she would like to know, uh, with your new article, uh, did you feel that you needed to include a white character in your first book? Yes, I wrote uh, an article recently for the Toronto Star uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and and actually it was a two parter. So the so the most recent one was published uh, just this past week, uh, where I shared that one of the things that I was really worried about with my first novel was again finding that audience, um, and and I I do think my fears were well founded considering again um, you know I'm not bitter or anything, but I got rejected so many times. <laughs> <laughs> totally bitter um and, <laughs> and and so one of the one of the pieces of advice that actually another muslim writer gave me was that you know you a, a lot of times in books you have you need to have that kind of bridging character who shares perhaps the identity of of the the you know the target market uh and remember i was writing this in 2015 2016 and my, my thinking on this has definitely evolved and changed and so what I did was I put a young white female character who was the main main character's best friend. So I was switching the the stereotypical role of having like the the brown BFF be the sidekick character. In this case, it was the white woman who was the sidekick character. So I thought, okay, that's that's enough of a twist for me. I can lean into this. And what I found was that a lot of readers really kind of um, really enjoyed reading. Uh, her her name was Clara. Clara's perspective, uh, and they almost mm. wanted her to have more space uh, because they're so used to seeing things from a white character's perspective and having the white character be like the main person that all of the attention is drawn to. Whereas Clara was really the second banana to Aisha and and uh, her relationship with her boyfriend who was also white um, had nothing to do really with, uh, with, the, with the main love story of Aisha and Khalid. Uh, mm. So, but, but that was my insecurity of being like a new writer and just being like, when you've lived your entire life never seeing yourself represented anywhere, mm. Uh, mm. I just didn't trust it. I just didn't trust that people would take a chance on me. And and they did, but I, I wonder if I hadn't included a Clara character with even HarperCollins Canada. I think I would like to think that they would still have taken a chance on me. Um, and, and, and it was, you know, don't get me wrong. It wasn't, it was very natural. It wasn't like I jammed in a character that didn't need to be there. The, the book needed a Clara. She played her role. She had a complete character arc, et cetera. But I know in my heart, the real reason why I put her in there, and I can reveal this now, uh, you know, spoiler <laughs> alert, uh, three years after the book is out, too late now, can't take it back. Um, but that's why I included her. And my second book, uh, Hannah Khan Carries On, I do have a character named Lily, who is the main character's also uh, one of her good friends. Uh, she's a, she's Italian Canadian, and uh, there's another character named Yusuf. And Yusuf and Lily, Yusuf is Muslim. Uh, Lily is a uh, lapsed Catholic. Uh, they have a, like a romantic relationship, but it is very much on the back burner in the story. Like it it is a uh, one of many plots in the book. <clears throat> the focus of the novel is very much on Hannah and Aiden and her mother and the neighborhood and 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 all of the people who are who are there. Uh, and it was a very deliberate choice on my part. But you, oh, you could cool. totally short story Lily and Yusuf. Like I think you I could. I could. I put that on as a free story on your website. Oh my Please God! Why are you making more work for <laughs> no, me? No, no, no pressure. Talks like that. No pressure. 
<laughs> we want we want to read this. We do want to read this <laughs> for sure. Um, I have another question I want to ask, just uh, stemming off what Usma was saying. But we had a question come through for Asma. Uh, this uh, question is from Abu Bakar D. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, Abu Bakar would like to know: Is there a sense of loss when your writing is edited for the white gaze, and what compromises are too much to compromise? Well, that that's a great question. Um... I don't think I felt a sense of loss because, I mean, we live in majority white communities. That's our experience. And we're uh, working with white colleagues all the time. We have white friends. So it's, it's in a way you're reflecting your own reality as well as it actually is rather than writing something very insular. And that's how I prefer to write from a universal or global perspective anyway. Um, but I do feel there has been a great deal of mediation uh, particularly of my detective, Isa Khatek's identity, some things I wanted to do with him that I wasn't able to do in the first or second book that took me five books out to, to have the freedom to write him without apology, without compromise. Um, but I think that mostly or largely my editors have been very supportive of the direction in which I wanted to take the character and the things that I wanted to do with him. For They, wanted, they always wanted the two detectives, the white detective and the Muslim detective, to evolve into a romantic relationship. And though I dropped some hints of that in the beginning, I always said that this kind of man would only want to marry his partner in faith. So it wouldn't make sense to ever do that. Um, so I had to push my way a little bit to get to that place by book five. Uh, but where I see that most staggeringly was when my crime series was optioned by Lionsgate uh, for Hollywood. It was picked up by a production company Allison Shermer Productions, and then brought under the aegis of Lionsgate. And they worked on the pilot script for, I think, like two years. But I never got to see that script. I would have conversations off and on with the primary writer on the script. Um, because at that time, I was a new writer. I didn't have much editorial control over my books or my, or my characters. Uh, but when I finally saw the pilot script, and I saw how my pious Muslim detective had been rendered, and he, I mean, there's many sides to Issa. He's pious, but I also wrote him as this handsome brooding archetypal detective because those are the detectives I always loved to read. He was super attractive to women, very good looking but not really paying much attention to that about himself because I thought hell yes I'm gonna write a character like that. Our Muslim men are beautiful and interesting and sexy and intelligent and I'm tired of seeing the kinds who show up on Homeland in 24 so I'm gonna do the exact reversal and I wrote him as this person who had a very a very um, not only emotional but intellectual understanding of his faith and then I saw the character on the page and all of those elements that made him who he was had been stripped away. He was very critical of western foreign policy, he was very connected to the global ummah, um, he had this very humanitarian kind of outlook on the world and on the on the Hollywood script page he became this guy who was like what I what I like to jokingly call the national security Muslim. So like the FBI guy who's rah rah USA and who has no critique of, of the countervailing powers and he's just a tool in the machine and he's acceptable because he's the kind of Muslim who's not actually attached to his values. And so he can be portrayed on the screen. So in the series, Isa Khatek is a widower, but in the pilot script, his wife was still alive and, and she was a woman who drank alcohol. And I'm not saying that there isn't a whole range of behaviors among Muslims, but I was saying that isn't true to the character that I wrote. That's not somebody he would choose to marry because it was so uh, so out of line with his own personal values. And so it seemed to me that in all the things they had done to Isa in the pilot script, that there was nothing of Isa truly left, not how he understood his faith, not how he related to women, not how he related to national security, none of those issues. They had just made him this, like this caricature. And that would have been a huge compromise. But lucky for me, I can only think of Allah's intervention in this, that deal fell apart so that there were other much, much worse things in the script and that deal fell apart. So it never made it to screen. And I was very grateful because my middle name is my father's name and I never wanted to see my father's name on anything that even remotely resembled that. So I felt like in a way it was a blessing for me. And now 10 books on, I have much more creative control over my own work. So the next time, if you know, alhamdulillah, I'm lucky enough to get that far, I'll be able to put my own voice into it and direct it a bit further because I made all kinds of compromises that were okay for me. Like they moved the setting from Canada to the US, no problem. They made his wife alive instead of dead, no problem. They changed the season of the story from winter to summer, no problem. But that was, you know, they, they took steps that I, I thought were too great of a compromise and would have devastated me. 
Yeah, definitely. It's good that you need to stand your ground because you want to tell the story you want told. You don't want to tell a story that somebody else thinks you should tell. And I think that's it's really it's really good that you've taken that step as well. And I have to say the same with um you know Uzma's book in Aisha at last. There's like two kinds of Muslims, if that's even the correct way to, to frame it, um, uh, that are portrayed in that. And that's exactly what Asma was saying, that, you know, there's all these different kinds of behaviors, but, you know, uh, one is, you know, for a particular character, one is for another particular character, and you shouldn't have to compromise too much because that's the story you want told. These are the characters you want to share with the world. So fantastic. Um, the one question that I wanted to ask you um, as well, and again, thank you uh, everyone for their questions so far. Um, but the one question I wanted to ask you is this thing that I'm, I'm ringing true here is that there's not a lot of Muslim representation and that that gap is only just starting to close. As a Muslim reader yourself, how important is Muslim representation to you in books? I think for me, um, I'm always very happy to see it. And I'm also, also very happy to support Muslim writers. I'll buy their books. I, I will read, mm -hmm. read their books. Uh, and it, it's because uh, it was missing from my life for so long. Uh, that being said, I do read broadly. Like I'll, I'll read, mm. I, as I write a lot of romantic comedy, if there's a Muslim romantic comedy, I'm always going to be interested in that and I will read it. Um, but I also just want to know what else is happening in my genre, what other conversations are happening. Um, you know, so it's it's not just Muslim. I, I just want like the diverse representation. So th those are the kind of books yeah. that I, I enjoy reading. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I, I think like a lot of writers, I just read, I read everything. Um, but we need more. You're right. We're only just starting, on, I think, to open the door into the type of diverse the diversity that uh, that exists even within our own community. So I might write a book where you know some people might think that my characters are more have a more conservative understanding of their religion. You know the the what I was saying before, but I was sharing before about my and my romance. The main characters don't don't even touch. But there, I understand that there's a continuum. There's a spectrum of uh, religious thought on this, and that's what we need to see more of. Not that Muslims come in, you know, two different flavors, practicing or not practicing. But there's like a whole, um, whole diversity of thought. And you know, uh, Asma's your your story that you shared is, you know, it was so scary. Really, uh, to, this is what happens when your story is in the hands of someone who doesn't understand what's at stake. I think for our community. Uh, when our stories that have been so hard fought and it's been so difficult to get them through the publishing process, when they're translated onto the screen and they do something like that, it's just like they did you so dirty there, really. Mm. And, and one of the, the chief lessons that I would like to impart to people is you need an agent so that you hold on to all of your rights, your film and TV rights, your translation rights, your foreign rights. And when you're new, it's not often possible to keep all of those rights from a powerful publisher. Uh, which is why you need your agent and your editors to be strong advocates of the kind of work you're doing. Otherwise, you'll find yourself helpless like I was in that situation. Like if it had gone forward, I wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. So mm. I always thank the divine intervention for that. But just a, just an important note to keep in mind. For me, yes, representation is really important because of, you know, the decades of horrific representation and misrepresentation that we've seen, you know, since pretty much since the Iranian revolution on our television screens. Um, yeah where we don't even recognize ourselves in the stories that people tell about us or about our communities where the, the men hate women and they're oppressive and hostile and the women are timid and submissive and don't have a thought on their head. And the most important thing is whether or not they wear the hijab rather than how they live their life and express their Islamic values. So we've been seeing a lot of that, you know, men hitting women on TV shows, for example. Um, in, in books, it's usually, if there are Muslim characters, it's usually in political thrillers and they're usually terrorists with no regard for life or if you think of that mm. film um, I think it's called Munich where mm. um, Palestinian ter terrorists had no regard for human life but the Mossad called off their operation just so they could spare a single female child um, and so those the contrast between those kinds of narratives were so disheartening and demeaning and angering and you either spend all your time in a tightly furled ball of rage and grief or you do something about it you put your own thoughts on paper you take back the narrative you speak up for yourself and you write what you know that other people don't know and that you can see those false projections onto yourself. And I kind of had an apprenticeship period doing that when I was the editor-in-chief of a North American magazine called Muslim Girl, where we were telling the stories of girls who lived in the US and Canada, what they'd accomplished, what they'd achieved, what their hopes were. And we had a, a feature column called Women to Watch where we highlighted our role models and and that was a really a chance to, and it got so much global attention because people hadn't seen that before. Um, and it was like, oh, do Muslim, and I would get questions like, oh, do Muslim girls read? Do Muslim girls think? 
do Muslim girls have freedom? Do Muslim girls do sports? Do they play music? Like it was just the misconceptions about our community were so astonishing and enormous. And it was a chance for all these girls and their own voices to correct them. And I thought this is what we need to keep doing. But yeah. the other side of it as an artist is you're not always wanting to think of a mission or a message. You're really engaged in storytelling and you want that freedom from these other pressures because all of us, I think, fulfill to some degree that ambassadorial role. Or as I, as I often say over here, when I give talks in local communities, I'm the first Muslim a lot of people have ever met. Um, and so usually all their questions have nothing to do with the book I've written, but with my own reality as a Muslim woman, um, which is fine because I view that as an opportunity to do dawah or to educate people or to try and build bridges. But creatively, you're yearning for something more to build this beautiful world with your words and to, to reach your community, to represent your community, but also to, pr to create something that's, that's actually art that will stand the test of time. And that'll be yeah. a legacy that you leave behind. So I think we face these challenges all the time that we're doing representation. And, and Osma and I have talked about this a lot, that when, when will we get to a point in our storytelling where we don't have to be so careful about feeding into Islamophobia, where we can somewhat be critical of our own communities, where we can talk about our failures and our failings and, and represent the whole person or the whole community in a way. Mm -hmm. um, because we feel like we have to be so careful because the um, you know anti-Muslim climate in, in the United States in particular is so virulent that we don't want to do anything that feeds into it, even if mm. we want our stories to be as authentic as possible. So I think it's artistically, it's a really serious challenge that maybe not a lot of other communities face. And certainly, mm. I don't think the white community faces that because, you know, they're swimming in mm. their own pond. That's true. That's very true. It's, it's interesting what you said in, you know, in terms of that misconception. You know, I'm tirelessly talking to people about, you know, Muslim women and what we're about, what we do. And at the end of the day, I keep telling everyone, you understand we're just people, right? <laughs> like we're just people we wake up we go to work or we go to school and um and you know it's just that's incidental to our life that we just happen to be muslim women who practice our faith but we're creative and we do more you know with our lives we're just people like nothing to be afraid of um we have time for two more questions i've got one question that's come through now and oxen probably wanted to ask the last question so i'll unmute her shortly um, so the, the last question that's come through was from Abdullah Norman. Norman, thank you very much for your question. Um, this is for both of the writers. Do you consider yourself a Muslim writer or a writer who is Muslim? Nobody lives or writes in a vacuum and what is manifested is informed not just by their faith, but a diverse set of experiences. There is a difference between a writer who is a Muslim versus someone who writes about the Muslim experience deliberately. Would you like to share your thoughts on this? good question <laughs> yeah it's a very it's a very good question um i think i'd like to think that i think of myself as a writer who is muslim uh but every time i sit down to write i'm always really aware that i am a muslim writer if that makes sense so it's yeah. what Asma was talking about was that burden of representation uh that sense of i don't want to fan the flames of islamophobia through my possibly extremely honest and rightful criticism of my own community and I get this question a lot. In fact, when I when I do presentations in front of my Muslim community, uh, as I am occasionally asked to do, they always ask me how how did the non-Muslim community react to your books? And the non-Muslims want to know how what the Muslims think about my books. So everyone's very interested in everyone else's reaction. Uh, and I have to say, for the most part, everyone is really happy. I I think to see this representation, if someone has picked up my book, is because they might have a personal relationship to it, or they're curious and they want to know more. Um, and I'm just really aware of this. Like I know that my mother will be reading my books, and my you know uh, people that I've grown up with that I that I've gone to, to the mosque with are going to be reading this book. And there's so much. I don't know how to put this, almost like trauma of seeing ourselves represented in such a toxic, dysfunctional, um, uh, lack, you know, just dishonest way for our mm -hmm. entire lives. That is almost like uh, for the few Muslim creatives who are out there doing that work, we have to take on that responsibility of healing that toxicity. And not to say that I'm never tempted to write propaganda. Um, I'm never <laughs> tempted to, <laughs> um, first of all, I'd be terrible at it. Uh, and, and, but, but I'm also, I am tempted to, you know, like, like my books are, are funny romantic books about Muslim characters. And it's now as I'm entering into my third novel that I feel 
a little bit more emboldened to tackle some of the issues that I always think about, but maybe I don't always write about. So I'm hoping to become a writer. And, and for instance, some of the things that I that I think about, and Asma knows this, uh, is is the, the patriarchy in the Muslim community, the way that Muslim women are treated compared to Muslim men, especially in public places. Um, you know, just to give you a, an example of what I mean, without devolving into that whole stereotype of the over um, over controlling father and the daughter who must run away from her faith. Like, can we have a new, more nuanced conversation than just that and talk about it more from a systemic uh, lens rather than a purely domestic lens? So, so to give you an example of what I mean, and yet still write a love story that that kind of mm. says says some of those things. So I feel like maybe this is something that as I'm becoming a more experienced writer, I'm feeling emboldened. Uh, and I'm bringing my readers along with me as I as I grow and I change. Uh, I hope to be a writer who writes, who is also Muslim, but it, it really is also a privilege to be here, to be as a Muslim writer. And um, I'm, I'm, I feel blessed and grateful that I've been given this opportunity to represent even my interpretation of the faith and my interpretation of my lived experience, which I know might be different from everyone else's. Wonderful. That's uh, a great answer, Isma. Um, yeah. And it's, it's such a tricky question. Um, mm -hmm. let me think. <laughs> uh, I, I think I, I thought about it um, while Isma was speaking too. And I think much to maybe my surprise and the audience's surprise, I think of myself as a Muslim writer, not as a writer who is Muslim. I am continually writing about our experience, either individually or globally or through the lens of particular communities. And um, that's what I want to do. And I am... Um, I was having a, a bit of a crisis sometime in the middle of the, right, my writing career. So I called this young imam for some advice and said, should I keep going in this vein? Are these books ever going to get any traction? You know, it doesn't seem like people are that interested in the global refugee crisis or um, in a hate crime in a mosque or like a, a mosque massacre. It's hard to interest people, particularly in a moment when people are looking for escapism in their fiction. Am I doing the right thing? And he gave me this really beautiful piece of advice where he said that, um, God gives different people different gifts and different responsibilities. And what you're doing is fulfilling the one that was given to you. And then when, once I started thinking about it like that, not like I'm God's chosen or anything like that, but just that I have a responsibility, um, not only to my community, but to my creator, it really made my work more impactful for me. Because whatever career I've had, whether it's in the law or uh, in different areas in publishing, or when I used to practice immigration and refugee law, it was really always towards this, you know, furthering social justice for all of humanity in as much as you can in your little small corner of the world and in your small life. And so my writing was just a continuation of that. And all of that has been informed by Islamic ethics and um, the Islamic perspective on social justice issues. So for me, that's very fulfilling. That's what I want to be known for. It's not all I can do, but it's certainly primarily what I do. Um, and I want to keep writing in that vein because I don't think even now, even though I've been making this list with something like 150 Muslim writers, there's not enough of our voices out there yet. Um, and there's not enough uh, variety in the types of stories that we tell. And there's not enough pushback against this hideously hateful um, Islamophobic rhetoric that we have to absorb every minute that we're awake. So I think, you know, it's not easy at times, but it, like Osma said, it is a privilege uh, and a blessing to have the platform. And then I, I just, I hope to continue to use it wisely and to learn more and be guided more so that I can do it in a way that's impactful. Inshallah. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, so that's cool. amazing. No, yeah. I, I, you are both so inspirational awesome. to me. You are both awesome and inspirational. Like, I'm an emerging writer and I'm trying to, you know, write a book that represents, well, you know, my own self in the sense that, you know, Indonesian, Australian, Muslim, that has a heritage or ancestry that was once Hindu. So, you know, trying to put all that together and, you know, marrying it all up in, through an urban fantasy lens. So um, it, I feel like that's a privilege that I have an opportunity to do that, but at the same time, add that responsibility as well. Um, okay, we've got time for that final question, which is coming in from Aksan. I'm just going to see if I can unmute Aksan, our co-founder. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry for all my fingers. <laughs> I'm on a screen. Um, yes, Aksan, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I do. Sorry, Wonderful. and you didn't read my question before anyway, but the previous questions are all answered uh, that were asked through the previous questions. Uh, okay. so thank you so much. But that was, I think, as an emerging writer, my greatest 
inhibition as a Muslim, a practicing Muslim, is, is the fear of making that irreversible mistake because the pen is that, isn't it? You know, it's, it's cementing. Once you write it down, uh, the repercussions, you don't know how it can go. And I think it's my strong moral, it, 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 that is my greatest fear. And uh, Osma said, it is with time that you feel more emboldened to take that risk because you feel more confident. And you've also answered the question that you do. I mean, even as practicing Muslim writers, uh, we have people we go to to guide us or give us in, uh, inspiration or advise us with our, um, our fears. And that's our or making a morally wrong mistake by our creator, by Allah SWT. But thank you so much, um, uh, Osma and Asma. It's I think you have touched on a very serious uh, topic. And I think this is what deters lots of Muslim, emerging Muslim writers from writing uh, that fear on an Islamic level, isn't it? So I mm -hmm. wanna say thank you very much. And I'll, uh, any other questions come through and come through there. <laughs> thank you so much, Aksan. Sorry, yeah, she did send something through, but it didn't come through to the chat to let me know that the question was answered. But thank you so much, uh, Aksan. Um, look, unfortunately, we do have to wrap this up because, I mean, I could talk to the, both of you all day. But um, first of all, to the viewers, thank you very much for coming today and joining us. Um, here it's morning on a Sunday morning and overseas um, well, where they are, it's evening. So thank you so much for being here. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of these books, I highly recommend them. I've got two on my shelf here. Head to Better Red Than Dead, our festival partners. They do have stock of their books. If they don't have it straight away, they can order it in for you. And it is free shipping. Remember that. Um, it's really good at a time like this, especially when we're still in a lockdown situation. Um, but look, to both Uzma and Asma, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here, sharing your wisdom and advice with us. Uh, please keep us informed in terms of what's next for both of you. I'm looking out for that stage play and potentially a, a Muslim sci-fi. Like I'm really <laughs> looking out for those. Please keep, please keep us informed. Thank you, Jazakallah Khairan. Thank you very much. Um, anything you'd like to say to wrap this up to either of you? Oh, I just want to say well, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, this was, this was a really interesting discussion for me. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you yes, so much. You. Thank, thank you, you to your organizers. Thank you to your attendees. Hello to Irene and Melati, whom I know. Thank you. Yes, um, and I just yes, wanted to say, think, think about mounting um, Osma's play in Australia once the rights become yeah. available. I would love to. I think that would be uh, something really great to talk do. Talk to me. Yes, please, please talk to me because we're like, I, yeah. I, I want to be able to see this play, not just have to watch it on my screen. So that would be amazing. And that way, you know, both Asma and Uzma can come to Australia. That would be great. Oh, we'd love that. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. We'd love yeah. That. yeah, we have, we'll have to have some, um, you know, halal food, you know, lunch or something. Oh, that yeah. would be great. Yeah. We'll take it to all those that. halal places. <laughs> a wonderful. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Have a wonderful evening ahead. Stay safe. And to everyone tuning in, please stay safe and take care. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.